Okay, Peter, thanks very much. Well, earlier today, the board of ANZ New Zealand announced the immediate departure of our chief executive, uh, David Hisco, and that Antonio Watson would continue as acting CEO. While David has been dealing with some medical issues, the ANZ New Zealand board was concerned about how he was characterising certain expenses and transactions following an internal review of personal expenses. Specifically, this related to the long-term personal use of corporate chauffeur cars, as well as charging the company for storage without proper disclosures. The amounts in dispute are in the tens of thousands of dollars. We are disappointed David is leaving ANZ under such circumstances. However, his departure demonstrates that when people do not do the right thing, we hold them to account, no matter their status or position in the organisation. This culture of strong values is one I and the ANZ New Zealand Board believe is important and why we have been open with the regulator, our customers and the public about this matter. David will, like anyone else, receive his contractual and statutory entitlements. This equates to 12 months notice and the leave he has already accrued. As a result of this decision, David has also forfeited his rights to around $6.4 million in equity. Turning to the future, we are fortunate to have an experienced executive in Antonio Watson, who has been for a number of years ANZ New Zealand's Managing Director Retail and Business Banking to step in while we conduct a search for a replacement. Antonio's extensive banking career has her well placed to help steer ANZ through this transition. Antonia. Kia ora tato. Good morning everyone. It's a day of shock and disappointment for more than 7,000 staff at ANZ New Zealand and 1,200 staff across ANZ Pacific. David Hisco was well liked as a leader. And in his nine years at CEO, he's helped to grow our bank to be a market leader. He's also been, op he's also been open minded and modern. More than 40% of the management roles in the bank are now held by women. And he's been behind the strong commitment ANZ has to promoting Māori, Pacifica and Asian cultures and LGBTQI staff. But the New Zealand leadership team and I stand firmly behind Sir John and the ANZ New Zealand board in believing that David has not met the standards and expectations of the organisation. We're all united in the belief that regardless of who you are at ANZ, if you're a young teller on the first day of your job or a CEO of 39 years experience, the standards are the same. Today, many of us feel let down. And to be fair to David, he accepts as a leader, he has to be accountable. Thank you. We're happy to take some questions. Yes, sir. Has he paid the money back? Uh, we're not requiring him to pay the money back. And the reason for that is that uh, David is adamant that he had authority for the expenditure that was undertaken. Uh, if he did have that authority, it was oral in nature, so it's, it's difficult to establish one way or the other. Uh, what is at the heart of this issue, though, is the way that that expenditure was recognised in our books. In other words, it was either, in our view, mischaracterised or there was a lack of transparency. So it's not about the money itself, it's the way it was recognised in the ANZ records. So, so John, did he deliberately try and hide uh, Well, he has an explanation for the way that that expenditure was recognised in the books. Um, all I can say is that he was aware it wasn't in the form that it actually took place. In other words, it looked like a business expense when it was a personal expense, but he was strongly of the view that he was allowed to do that and therefore was acting within, within his authority. What I would say is that we as an organisation and the New Zealand board and me as chairman expect transparency from not only our CEO, but from every person who works for this company. We have to be able to have trust in what people are recognising in our records. And in that, in that regard, David would say he didn't meet the standards he set for the rest of our staff and for himself. So John, did he, was he fired or did he resign? I think the way to characterise it is that we parted company um, from the moment, uh, and it was mutual, from the moment that we had this discussion with him. Uh, David was very firmly of the view that, that you know, probably we should part company, and I think that was the, the, the view that the New Zealand board had over time. So it was a mutual thing, really. What prompted So Just in terms of the, well, prompting the review, um, the group chief executive, Shane Elliott, decided to undertake a review 
of expenses of some of his members of his executive team. Um, as part of that review, it, it threw up some anomalies, which you know then later on group investigations went and had a look at. So that was the starting point, if you like. Um, what it also showed was that there were no other issues that could be identified, but in this particular instance it, it set that off. Um, in terms of the police, no, because I think it's really important to understand that we're not contesting the actual expenditure of the money. So in other words, you know, David is adamant he had authority, we accept that he had authority. What is at the heart of this issue is that the way that that money was spent was not accurately recorded in our accounts, and for that reason we have a real issue with that. No, we don't believe there are systemic issues. I mean, firstly, we have thorough reviews that constantly go on from internal to external audit to uh, right through the business lines. There's a transparent process, actually, for the review of expenses. This was a little more tricky to see because it was a direct chargeback invoice, if you like. It wasn't something that went through a credit card, uh, which is actually standard practice for the use of, of, of cars and, and similar sorts of things in this area. And actually, as a result of the review that the Chief Executive of Australia undertook for the, at his level, um, it hasn't identified any other issues. So we don't think it's systemic, we think it's one-off, but nevertheless it's been there for a while. So three months ago, I was advised by the Chief Executive of Australia, as part of the, of the, the way these things work, that there was a, uh, they had he'd undertaken a review and that some anomalies were showing up at that stage we weren't aware what that all meant. There could have been a plausible and credible explanation for all of that. Um, then Group Integrity went through their review. Um, at an appropriate time, obviously, the New Zealand Board, and on behalf of them, I spoke to uh, David, and then there's been an ongoing process over the last few weeks. He, look, he genuinely has some health issues. I don't intend to go through those health issues because that's a matter for him to take up, but he has some genuine health issues. They sit alongside this issue, if you like, the separate matters. So did you know about it at the time when he went on sick leave? Uh, did I know that he... about, you know about the anomalies? The, 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 the things were pretty similar but uh, in terms of timing, but actually some of these health issues he had been working through and they had been there for quite some time actually. Um, I have no doubt that the stress of this situation added to this, but he does have some genuine health issues. In terms of the timing, it follows the RBNZ censure of the bank over capital requirements. Did that, was that involved? Did you look at that as well in terms of a performance issue? Uh, no, I mean, look, they're very separate issues, the operational um, risk capital issue. I think, I mean, David would also say if he was here today that he would take some responsibility for that as the CEO of the, of the organisation. But they're quite separate issues. Uh, um, that, and I don't in any way wish to minimise what took place in terms of operational risk capital. The board takes the attestation process very seriously. We take the, the fact that we failed to have a properly approved model operating very seriously. We've apologised for that and we've taken the, the appropriate consequences that, uh, that the Reserve Bank have, have um, in, in put, put on ANZ Bank. I think it is just worth understanding though that in terms of that issue, because there's been some media debate about it, um, there was an issue where a person quite junior in the organisation made a call, they thought they had authority, actually didn't have that. Um, the board believed it was getting the right advice because in writing it was advised that actually the models were compliant. The amount of, of capital that that calculation is one of 45 models we had um, actually showed a, about a $23 million capital difference against the bank holding about $3.5 billion of, of excess capital on top of its overall capital which holds, which is about, you know, well, in total we hold about $13 billion. So it's, in terms of capital, there were no operating issues for the bank, if you like. Did you ever consider resigning, like Kerry McDonald suggested that you should? No, uh, and I think that would be inappropriate because, firstly, we're not the only bank that's had an issue in, in this area. Secondly, if you look at what the Reserve Bank requests and demands of directors in terms of, um, in terms of the attestation process, it says that you are quite quite entitled to rely on um, the advice that you get. The board went through a very thorough and does go through a very thorough process of actually 
ensuring that it feels comfortable that what it's signing it is in, in a position to be able to do that. Now, you know, there was a couple of things. Firstly, we picked it up ourselves and self-identified. The IMF did actually itself say to the Reserve Bank it believed that the whole system in New Zealand should change from a negative attestation process to a positive attestation process. We've done that. But on top of all of this, obviously we're not satisfied with the fact that we made an error. We, hope we own up to that error and as a result of that, you know, the board has demanded that we go through now, once again, an external review to make sure that, that, that we, meet, we are meeting the standards and everything is compliant. But you know, it's, just, it's just worth remembering that, that you know, it, the Reserve Bank itself in its own words are that the directors absolutely have to make sure that they are following, they are following and the rules and they are asking the right questions and, and going through that process when we're doing that. Into the personal transactions, also include the one between yourself and David Hisco regarding the purchase of your house. Uh, no, it hasn't. But that's again a very transparent uh, uh, issue. At the time at which um, he bought our beach house, um, either I was can't remember if I was actually on the board. I wasn't chairman. I don't think. Um, but but I have to go and have a look at that. Uh, but I made sure that the group was at a senior level, and to including the chairman in Australia and the CEO, were absolutely. Um, uh, clear about what had taken place. It was, it was. Uh, we had the house for sale. They wanted to buy one. They bought it. Uh, that is what it is. Um, but there's been no attempt so to. So apart from this one trans these transactions that uh, we're talking about with David Hisco, were there any other transactions that arose from this investigation? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, the transactions that we have concerns about were these ones. Uh, the other executives we looked at and the other expenses we looked at were all in order. What was the? Um, what was he storing? Uh, what, what was he using the cards for? Oh, look, largely they used it as a personal nature and um, he believed he had authority to do that um, for reasons of being an expat and, and the, the nature of some discussions he'd had with, with executives in Australia. Um, so it was over in Australia, was it the storage? Uh, oh, well, the wine storage was in Australia. The, um, the cars were primarily in New Zealand, primarily in New Zealand. But he believes he had authority to do that. We accept that. But we just what we don't accept is the way they are recorded in our accounts. So I don't um, the cars, the chauffeurs. I mean, he, he was using them for personal trips. Yeah, it? that's in, in a nutshell. Yeah. So, so John, did you say wine storage? Yeah, that was one. Yeah, how, how, how many bottles? How many cans? Don't know. Do you, do you have any more specifics around? You said tens of thousands yeah. of dollars. Do you have any a more specific number than that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we we have a sense of the the, the overall number. Um, it's in that order of magnitude. I think if we get down to an absolutely specific number, someone well, might want to split it. Was it 99,000, you know, close to 100,000? Uh, if you went somewhere in the middle, you might be more accurate. It's, it's, it, look, it's over uh, what we suspect is a nine year period. So it's, it's, uh, it's you know, in that order of magnitude. Over nine years, how did this not get picked up before now? Nine years is a long time. So firstly, um, it's direct chargeback, so it's not, it's not going through credit cards and things. So credit cards you know, are obviously you know, reviewed clearly. These are also reviewed um, from time to time, but because they were mischaracterised, they were difficult to pick up. So why now? Why, why have you decided that you didn't keep the records right now and not using half years ago? Well, we, we constantly do reviews and we constantly seek to improve the, the, the way we look at information and the way we learn from that. And, you know, as part of that that process, we found it, and, and you know what it, what it shows you, I think, is that we are thorough and we and we we take these matters seriously. But you know, that, they're not easy things always to pick up, and, and they're relatively small amounts of money. In, in terms of his total remuneration, it, it sounds strange when all these other things are going on that you choose now to pick up on what could be seen as quite a small amount of money. Yeah. Okay. So I think that the the point that's worth remembering here is that. You know, I set the standards for the ANZ Bank on behalf of the board. And those standards have to be ones of trust and transparency. And the simple bottom line is that we have to apply the same standards to a freshly minted teller who starts work for us on day one as we would with the CEO. David, by his own admission, would say he failed that standard. It was not transparency and we couldn't accurately see what the expenditure was for. If a junior person in the organisation did that, the consequences would be the same. And I think our shareholders, I think our 
um, customers, I think our, our staff and I think the regulators would expect us to be consistent and fair and that's the reason we've done that. We take what we consider to be fair action for everyone in the organisation. What is question? You, you, you trust transparency, but what about morality? I mean, this seems astounding from a man who's paid as well as, as, as he is paid. Well, you have to ask him that question, but all I can say to you is that he believed, and we have accepted, that he had authority for this. Um, he has an explanation, I'm not going to bother going into that, about why it was recorded in the way it was. Um, and, and again, uh, that's, that's the situation that we're in. But all I can tell you is that I don't believe that, sets the stand, that meets the standard that David would set under normal circumstances. I don't think it meets the standard that the New Zealand board and I set. And for that reason, it was a pretty simple decision on both sides that we should part company. What is the value of his, trans of his payout? Oh, well, it's a matter of public record. It's one year of his income and, and his accrued uh, long service leave. Um, on the, on the, the counter side of that, he forfeits about $6.4 million of equity or performance rights. Oh, I think it's in the order of about $2 million. Through this agreement, is he free to speak publicly? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's no sort of gagging order from ANZ on that? No, no, not at all. You're welcome to call. Uh, well, there was, uh, as I said earlier on, there was a review undertaken by the group CEO um, that, that identified that there could be some concerns. Uh, we went through a process. We obviously have our own teams of people who look at issues because, you know, from time to time there are issues and we investigate those. And then um, I had a discussion on behalf of, of the board with the CEO. Last night? No. What I don't know exactly. It was some time ago now. In, in the order of weeks. But. Any last questions of Sir John? Sir John, Tony needs to go to a meeting. So it's, it's, it's pretty good to get you. We, we haven't had really had a chance as business journalists to ask you about the capital requirements. Yeah. Um, could you give us a comment on um, the impact on ANZ on the, the proposed capital requirements changes? Uh, yeah, well look, we've put in our submission along with the other banks. I think those submissions become public relatively soon. Um, we've been quite clear that um, there would be significant implications, we think, um, for our customers, both in terms of the quantum of credit we could make available and the cost of that credit. Um, we fully recognise and acknowledge the Reserve Bank's um, both responsibilities and rights to test what the adequate level of capital that banks hold is. We are in ongoing discussions with them um, and, and we, we obviously believe that, that, that having the new bank capital requirements set at different levels is the right settings for New Zealand, but we accept in the end the authority for making those decisions rests with the Reserve Bank. Are you Well, Antonia as, runs that business, yeah. so she's. As, as, as part of the stress test that we do annually, we test things like simultaneously, forty percent to fifty percent drop in house prices, thirteen percent unemployment, negative GDP, foot and mouth disease, all sorts of negative impacts income, and those. And, and the Reserve Bank's pretty transparent about the um, the stress test that they do for us, and we are not in a position to break the bank under those circumstances. Okay. So, John, just one final question about, uh, from the gallery. Um, have you uh, uh, spoken to Simon Bridges, given him any advice, and how do you think he's going at the moment? <laughs> uh, well, from time to time I do talk to Simon. Uh, I think he sensibly doesn't necessarily need to take or seek my advice, uh, but I will be going to national conference in, in a month or so, so I'll, I'll see him there. How long will Antonia be uh, acting in this position? Uh, what's your plan? Yeah, so I mean, look, um, we are very lucky to have a very strong team actually that that, um, that uh, David developed for us, and the, and the, the, the heart of all of that is is Antonia. Uh, she, as you know, has been doing an outstanding job for us, running the biggest part of of our of our business. She'll be acting CEO until we um, go through the process of identifying you know the permanent 
uh, replacement for David Hisco, but we hope she puts her name forward and we'll be looking at her uh, application if she does. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much.